Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, warm greetings to all. I'm Somava Basu, uh, the uh, president and founder of the Council for Global Cooperation. And I welcome you all to the most awaited event of CGC. Today, today's academic session titled Genocides in 20th and 21st Century World is an initiative hosted by CGC's Genocide, Holocaust and Disaster Studies Vortex. Mm -hmm. The CGC is an international nonpartisan forum aimed at tackling global issues that shape our modern world through independent research, analysis, and open dialogue, platform for extensive research, commentary, and analysis, and informed dialogue that promotes global cooperation. Our council has established its priorities for major political, economic, social, and geopolitical issues regarding professional research and academic analysis. The major projects and pressing themes we have undertaken and focus are on genocide, holocaust, and disaster studies. Mm -hmm. studies, on third, studies on third world uh, and international area studies. Uh, this organization aims to uh, provide analysis in depth and solutions for global policy, informing the people, analyzing the crisis, and suggesting peaceful and effective resolutions. Man made catastrophes such as genocide is one of the highest crimes uh, observed among human race that impact people for generations to come. The term genocide, the term, the term genocide entailed entails targeted methodical mass extermination of group of people sharing a common identity. Though infrequently genocides have continued to dot their uh, deplorable occurrences uh, on the world map up against the deterrence of institutional infrastructure, which the international community has sought and occasionally failed to provide since 1945. Genocides, genocide studies traces its intellectual roots to the field fields of anthropology, sociology, and international relations. The study seeks to isolate and analyze every such historical occurrence to decipher the patterns of political and or social acts and processes, which invariably lead to the unfolding of such mass killings. Today, when Europe is again in the midst of a war, the subject of genocide has again become, be, again become an alarming world concern for the institutions and international organizations, and of course, for people across globe. The need to take up the study of genocide is to strengthen the eff effectiveness of institutional deterrence by provide, providing an effective and e efficient uh, forewarning system to predict and or intervene to prevent the unraveling of this scourge as witnessed in Cambodia, Rwanda, and as lately witnessed Myanmar. Today with CGC's session on genocide, I'm optimistic that we would be able to make an important impact among the young scholars having interest in this area study and further send message to the world communities working in prevention for decades. It gives me immense pleasure and honor to host this session on such an important subject of international area studies. Today, it is our great privilege to have with us three eminent scholars and experts who shall join this session and discuss with us their insights on this important theme through their long-standing and extraordinary scholarship. In this panel, we have Professor Ben Kernan. Professor Kernan is a genocide specialist and historian who is the A. Whitney Griswold Professor Emeritus of History at uh, Yale University. He was the founding director of the Cambodian Genocide Program and of the Genocide Studies Program from 1998 to 2015. Additionally, he was the Professor of International Area Studies at Yale's Macmillan Center and the Chair of Yale's Council on Southeast Asian Studies. Professor Kernan has numerous award-winning publications in his, names, in his name that includes How Pol Pot Came to Power, Genocide and Resistance in Southeast Asia, Blood and Soil, uh, World his, uh, History of Genocide and Extermination from Sparta to Darfur. And finally, Vietnam, a history from earliest times to the present. 
We welcome you, Professor Kernan. Then uh, we have. Then we have in the panel Professor Omar Bertov. Professor Bertov is the Samuel Pisser Professor of Holocaust and Genocide Studies, and John P. Berkland, Distinguished Professor. Uh, distinguished Professor of European History at Brown University. He is a local affiliate of the Center for European Studies at Harvard University and previously had served as junior Harvard Fellow from 1989 to 1992 and 2002 Guggenheim Fellow. Professor Bertov is one of the leading figures on the genocide, on the subject of genocide, Holocaust, German and Jewish history, whose award-winning books whose award-winning works include Mirrors of Destruction, Anatomy of a Genocide, Tales from the Borderlands, Making and Unmaking the Galician Past, and several others. Apart from his career as a historian and educator, Professor Bertov is an excellent literator whose novel, The Butterfly and the Axe, is upcoming soon. <laughs> uh, congratulations on the new book, Professor Bertov. Uh, we, it's going to be a really great book and we await to read it. Uh, and welcome to our panel. Mm. Lastly, we have Professor Hannibal Travis. Professor Travis is the Professor of Law at College of Law, Florida International University. He joined teaching career after several years of practice in the field of intellectual property and inter internet law at O. Melvaney and Myers in San Francisco, California, and at De Bois and Plimpton in New York. Besides his research interests in, in the fields of law, Professor Travis is an exceptional scholar on genocide and human rights. His works have appeared in several edited volumes and scholarly journals. He is the editor of the book, The Assyrian Genocide, Cultural and Political Legacies, published in 2017, and the author of books, Genocide, Ethno-Nationalism, and the United Nations, and further, Genocide in the Middle East. Professor Travis is an advisory board member to several legal and genocide research associations and journals, namely Genocide Watch, Genocide Studies and Prevention, Association Quarterly Journal, among others. We are greatly honored to have you, Professor Travis, in, in our panel. Without further delays, I would like to pass on the stage to our first speaker, Professor Ben Kernan, who would be delivering a talk on comparative analysis on genocidal atrocities and, uh, and accountability for genocide in his lecture titled uh, Hitler, Stalin and Khmer Rouge. Over to you, Professor Kernan. Thank you very much, Sumava. It's a great privilege for me to be here. Uh, in his uh, 2015 book, The Rise of Islamic State, ISIS and the New Sunni Revolution, the Middle East expert, Patrick Coburn, uh, could you show slide number two, please? Uh, sure, Coburn sir. wrote of the, quote, religious intolerance and political authoritarianism of Wahhabism, the fundamentalist 18th century version of Islam, that lies behind the contemporary Islamic State movement. Coburn wrote that in its readiness to use violence, it has many similarities with European fascism in the 1930s. But Coburn also wrote of Islamic State, the world had seen nothing like their use of public violence to terrorize their opponents since the Khmer Rouge in Cambodia 40 years earlier. Drawing similarities between the violence of genocidal Middle East jihadis, pre-war European fascists, and Khmer Rouge communists can yield comparative insights on conditions and motivations that give rise to genocide. It is possible for such disparate movements to share characteristics, if not connections, for a range of reasons. They may, one, simply emerge from similar socio-political backgrounds, or instead, two, 
they may deliberately borrow ideas or practices from one another, or else they may, three, independently and quite unknowingly adopt similar strategies and tactics. Any of these possibilities could prove revealing for people hoping to understand, deter, or defeat such political forces. Pol Pot's Khmer Rouge regime of democratic Kampuchea, which ruled Cambodia from 1975 to 1979, shared some important characteristics with Nazism, but it also demonstrated some important connections to Stalinism. Although democratic Kampuchea or DK emerged from Cambodia's quite different socio-political environment, its leaders did independently adopt some similar practices to those of the Nazis, as well as quite selectively borrow ideas and practices from Stalinism and also Ma Maoism. The DK parallels with Nazi crimes are clear. One, virulent racism. Two, the perpetration of multiple cases of genocide and crimes against humanity. And three, ambitions of territorial expansionism and brutal aggression, in this case against all three of Cambodia's neighboring countries, not only Vietnam, but aggression against Thailand and even Laos as well. Pol Pot, the Secretary General of the Communist Party of Kampuchea, died in his sleep in 1998. Could we have slide number three, please? But 20 years later, in 2018, the UN-sponsored tribunal, the Extraordinary Chambers in the Courts of Cambodia, or ECCC, found Pol Pot's former Deputy Secretary General, Nguyen Chia, and the head of state of the former Pol Pot regime, Hugh Sampong, guilty of genocide of the ethnic Vietnamese minority in Cambodia, as well as guilty of perpetrating crimes against humanity against them. The tribunal in Phnom Penh convicted these two men, the most senior surviving leaders of the Pol Pot regime, of at least three counts of crimes against humanity, not only of murder and extermination of ethnic Vietnamese, but also of their persecution on racial grounds. The judges found in the cases of both Nguyen Chia and Q Sampon, quote, that the intended discriminatory acts were deliberate killing of Vietnamese on a large scale, unquote. Nguyen Chia was also found guilty of a second genocide, that of the ethnic Cham Muslim minority in Cambodia. The ECCC had previously, in 2014, convicted both men of crimes against humanity for the persecution and mass murder of members of their country's Khmer majority population. And they were already serving life sentences in Phnom Penh. In addition, Duc, the former commandant of the regime's central secret prison, S21, served a life sentence after being convicted in 2010 of crimes against humanity. Also in recent years, three other senior Khmer Rouge leaders have been arrested and jailed. Only Pol Pot himself and one other senior leader escaped arrest. Both died before the tribunal was formed. Q Sampon, by contrast, was the first head of state to be found guilty of genocide in an international court. How did these genocides take place? In his 1986 book, Brother Enemy, the veteran Indochina correspondent Nayan Chanda, who was born in India, described what he called a Cambodian version of a final solution to the Vietnamese threat. He went on, it was a campaign to physically exterminate all ethnic Vietnamese still remaining in Cambodia, unquote. Nayan Chanda was reporting in this book on his 1981 Phnom Penh interview with survivor Ross the Ruin, a Cambodian mechanic who had married an ethnic Vietnamese woman. In April 1977, while repairing a Jeep in the office of his district chief, Saruan had inadvertently read on the desk in the office 
a letter marked, quote, Directive from 870, the Machim, or Centre of the Communist Party of Kampuchea, or CPK. Dated April 1st, 1977, that letter ordered that, quote, all ethnic Vietnamese in the district and all Khmers who spoke Vietnamese or had Vietnamese friends should be handed over to the State Security Service, unquote. When Saruan got home later that day, his wife told him that a Vietnamese woman in the village had been bludgeoned to death by the Khmer Rouge. Several days later, Saruan's wife herself disappeared. He eventually found her partially buried corpse. More recently in 2021, the Cambodian political science scientist Kosal Pat has written in terms similar to those used by Nayan Chanda many years before. Quote, the Long Nol regime's 1970 violence against the ethnic Vietnamese community, he wrote, was a precursor to the Khmer Rouge adoption of its version of a final solution to the Vietnamese problem. A brutal policy, he went on, recognized as genocide by the 2018 judgment of the UN-sponsored tribunal, unquote. For their part, the Nazis murdered a proportion of Jews and Roma and Poles that was far higher than the proportional death toll among Germans in the Nazi era. Cambodia's minorities under the DK regime experienced a similar fate. About 15% of the rural Khmer perished in the DK period and 25% of the urban Khmer, suggesting an overall Khmer death rate that is among the majority Khmer population of about 18.7%. But the death rates were much higher among the major minorities. Ethnic Vietnamese, over 99% of those who remained in the country after 1976 were killed. Ethnic Chinese, 50% perished. Cham Muslims, between 36 and 41%. Lao, 40%. Thai, 40%. Now, of course, the absolute number of 1.3 million dead among the majority Khmer population is enormous and largely attributable to crimes against humanity. But many of these deaths occurred during the DK regime's largest episode of mass killing, that of the Eastern Zone Khmer population from May to December 1978, the last year of the DK regime. On May 10th, the regime called upon its forces to, quote, purify the masses of the people. And its forces murdered at least 100,000, possibly as many as 250,000 Khmers from the Eastern Zone in that short period of a few months alone. Those victims were accused of having, quote, Khmer bodies with Vietnamese minds. Kluan Khmer Ku Kabal Yun. In other words, the CPK turned its vicious racist ideology against its own Khmer people in a genocidal manner. To some extent, this had also happened in Nazi Germany. Hitler's quote, best field marshal, Walter Model, believed as Hitler did in German racial supremacy in Europe. But as with Hitler, that by no means extended to a loyalty to the German people as a whole, Model ordered ruthless punishment of what he called inferior elements in the civilian population. As defeat loomed, Hitler himself remarked, quote, if the war is lost, then the people too is lost. The people had shown itself to be the weaker. What will remain after this struggle will be in any case, only the inferior ones, since the good ones have fallen. During World War II, German military casualties alone rivaled even the massive continental Jewish death toll of nearly 6 million. As for the wartime civilian toll, the disabled, communists, homosexuals, Jehovah's Witnesses and others, the Nazis killed as many as 340,000 Germans, as well as 160,000 German Jews in their eugenics programs and their racial, political and religious persecutions. The political worldview of the Pol Pot group encompassed an obsession with Cambodian nat national 
and re racial revivalism. Could we have slide four, please? The CPK leaders would recover, in their view, Cambodia's, quote, original pre-Buddhist glory, surpass the powerful economy of the medieval Angkor Kingdom. Next slide, please. And regain its lost territory from Vietnam and Thailand. But the inspiration behind this vision was not totally indigenous. The experience of French colonialism had exaggerated this Cambodian sense of glory. Next slide, please. This sense of glory lost. For instance, a sculpture group erected in the 1920s at the stairway below Marseille railway station in France depicts a recumbent Cambodian Apsara, a celestial dancer, being attended by a prostrate Vietnamese boy and a Lao girl. The statuary here elevates Cambodia to a privileged position, superior to that of Vietnam and Laos. French colonial ideology aimed to preserve Khmer culture and to emphasize Cambodia's historic role in Southeast Asia. By excavating and studying the ancient monuments of Angkor, this colonial ideology was, however, also partly designed to keep restless Vietnamese in their place under French rule. And it was perfectly suited to encourage the young Salat Soa, the later Pol Pot, to dream of recasting himself as, quote, the original Khmer, Khmer Dam, as he called himself in Paris. Meanwhile, he arrived in Marseille in September 1949 by ship from Saigon. Next slide, please. It is easy to imagine him climbing the stairway to catch his first train to Paris, carefully studying this sculpture group depicting Cambodia's superiority to Vietnam. Born in 1925, Pol Pot had reached adulthood in French Indochina under the wartime pro-Nazi Vichy administration. He and Kusampon attended a Cambodian high school where every morning the pupils had to salute Vichy's Marshal Pétain with the words Maréchal Nouvoilà. Pétainist agrarian ideology focusing on the French countryside also percolated into Cambodia at that time. It is apparent in Kusampon's Paris doctoral dissertation on Cambodia's economy, which emphasized relying on the country's domestic agricultural resources and separating Cambodia from other nations' economies. This too suited Pol Pot's idea of falling back on the, quote, original Cambodia. The DK state under Pol Pot and Kusampon treasured the Cambodian race, not individuals. As Pol Pot put it in 1978, we do not worry that one day our army may run out of men for the local population from which we can recruit is unlimited, unquote. Khmer peasant casualties were not a problem. National impurities were. The impurities included the foreign educated, except for Pol Pot's own, own Paris educated group, and those the party center called hereditary enemies, especially Vietnamese. Hatred of the Vietnamese had roots in the personal as well as the political. Nguyen Chia has given us an insider account of what Pol Pot had personally told him about his racist beliefs. Pol Pot said to Nguyen Chia, I hated Vietnamese youth from the time I was young because the Vietnamese were rude and too clever at playing unfair tricks while playing football against me and other Cambodian children. But that childish personal prejudice grew political. On April 22, 1976, Pol Pot described Vietnam as, quote, a black dragon that spits its poison. The same month, the CPK official journal, Revolutionary Flags, described DK's expulsion of foreign nationals, its term for the domestic ethnic Vietnamese minority and the charms and the ethnic Chinese, even though most of them were Cambodia born and had lived in the country for decades. Later, the DK regime issued racist public statements such as this one, quote, 
The whole Kampuchea's people are against Vietnam, which is a hereditary enemy. Then in April 1978, Pol Pot publicly boasted that not a single Vietnamese remained living in Cambodia. The very next month, DK Radio launched an appeal to purify the DK armed forces, our party, and the masses of the people. The radio then added, each one of us must kill 30 Vietnamese. So far, we've succeeded. Using these figures, one Cambodian soldier is equal to 30 Vietnamese soldiers. We should have 2 million troops for 60 million Vietnamese. However, 2 million troops would be more than enough to fight the Vietnamese because Vietnam has only 50 million inhabitants. This DK radio broadcast on May 10, 1978, then went on to reveal the Pol Pot regime's willingness not only to annihilate all 50 million of Vietnam's inhabitants, but also to sacrifice 2 million of the 8 million Cambodians in the attempt. It continued, quote, we do not need 8 million people. We need only 2 million troops to crush the 50 million Vietnamese, and we still would have 6 million people left, unquote. It is clear that homegrown racism was an important feature of Khmer Rouge ideology. What about class? Pol Pot's DK regime did demonstrate important connections to Stalinism, including one, brutal class warfare, two, internecine political purges, and three, the enforcement of mass starvation. On the other hand, unlike Stalin's regime with its urban industrial bias, the Pol Pot regime pursued a rural bias similar to that of Mao's China, yet it claimed to outdo the latter with a super great leap forward, adding super to Mao's slogan of a great leap forward. DK's borrowings from both Stalinism and Maoism were clear, but quite selective. Could we have the next slide, please? In Cambodia in 1980, I photographed many of the prison records left behind by the Pol Pot regime, which had been ousted the previous year in 1979. On returning to Australia, I read Robert Conquest's book, The Great Terror, on the Soviet purges of the 1930s. This passage caught my attention. For the 1936 trial, Conquest wrote, Molchanov had prepared for Stalin a special diagram, a system of many colored lines on the diagram indicated when and through whom Trotsky had communicated with the leaders of the conspiracy. My mind immediately went back to the charts I'd photographed of alleged rebel or foreign agent contact networks drawn up by the DK security cadre at their headquarters, S21 prison. There are many colored lines connecting rows of boxes containing data on each person they implicated seemed almost a direct imitation of the Soviet technique of the 1930s. Further, conquest statement, we have the next slide please, that the dossiers of the leading figures targeted by Stalin have the low numbers, Pyatakov, one, Rade, five, Sokolnikov, eight, Drobnis, 13, took me back to my notes on the S21 dossiers, where I had written Roman numerals used by prison interrogators for top prisoners, the names of one to X1X of whom I had copied down. Now the use in each case of Roman numerals and even of similar diagrams may well be coincidence, but it was tempting to suspect otherwise, given the confessional nature of the Campuchian prison records. They resembled what we knew of the archives of Stalinism in nearly every way, with imp the important exception that the records were kept secret. Not even show trials were held in DK and the very existence of the S21 prison became known to the outside world only after that regime was overthrown. But could S21 security personnel have been formally trained in the bureaucratic and other interrogation techniques of the Stalinist purges, perhaps in Mao's China of the early 1970s? Other possible parallels and connections too are worth pursuing particularly in the realm of ideology. 
to what extent was Pol Pot's regime Marxist? And to what extent did it consider itself so? In early 1977, the CPK's number three, Yang Sari, the foreign minister of the regime, told foreigners in Singapore, we are not communists, we are revolutionaries. Now that was disinformation. The CPK itself was officially unveiled later that same year. But Yang Sari's statement was also a signal of a conscious departure from Marxist orthodoxy. Next slide, please. As the CPK's internal magazine, Revolutionary Flags, had put it in late 1976, quote, left or not left, we must stand by the movement. We must not stand by the scriptures, unquote. Now, what did that mean in terms of orthodox Marxism? The CPK leaders certainly believed in the existence of classes, including feudalists, capitalists, workers and peasants. They murdered many people as feudalists and capitalists, but they did not rigorously follow orthodox Marxist class analysis or strategy. Here is how Revolutionary Flags magazine put it in September 1976. Quote, there is a worker class which has some kind of stand. We have not focused on it yet. By 1977, the CPK was proclaiming in a party history, quote, we did not rely on the forces of the workers. The workers were the overt vanguard, but in concrete fact, they did not become the vanguard. In concrete fact, there were only the peasants. Therefore, we did not copy anyone, unquote. The key issue then is not the names of all these social divisions and classifications, but how they were applied and worked in practice. The methods by which the Pol Pot regime assigned people to classes were not necessarily determined by their relationship to the means of production or to one another or to their geographical origin. The Khmer word for class, Varna, is derived from the Hindu conception of caste, Varna. It implies a series of inherited status levels rather than Marxist dialectical relations between classes. If the CPK assigned people to a class based on their race, say, all Chinese are capitalists, or if it excluded people from a certain class because of their race, say, no charms are working class, and if such declarations contradicted the social facts, these would constitute clear cases of racism. And that is exactly what the Khmer Rouge did. All Chinese, according to them, were capitalists, and according to them, none of the charms were working class. The CPK forcibly imposed punitive racist generalizations on the Vietnamese, the charms, and the Chinese and they devastated those populations at rates even higher than were suffered by the majority Cambodian population. What about the Marxist theory of dialectical materialism? The September, October, 1976 issue of the CPK journal, Revolutionary Flags, described dialectical materialism as the most basic document of Marxism-Leninism. How then did the CPK approach this topic? In 1950, when Pol Pot was a student in Paris, Stalin republished his 1938 study entitled Dialectical and Historical Materialism. Could we have the next slide, please? Oh, yes, see, we have it already. Stalin's work divided the subject into three sections, the dialectical method, philosophical materialism, and historical materialism. The first section, the dialectical method, Stalin described as having four principal features, namely that all phenomena are organically interrelated. Second, nature is in continuous development and change and movement. Third, development uh, involves quantitative changes becoming qualitative ones. And four, internal contradictions are inherent in all things. Now, a quarter century later, in its September, October, 1976 issue, Revolutionary Flags, the CPK journal, presented what it called 
a, quote, review of dialectical materialism. And this revealed the influence on the CPK of Stalin's work, but without mentioning his name. It summarized, however, only the first section of Stalin's outline of the subject, as shown on the slide. Yet, Tung Padewat revolutionary flags called these four features the four laws of dialectical materialism. In other words, what for Stalin was only the method became for the CPK the philosophy itself. The CPK simply excluded Stalin's two materialist sections that followed his initial section on the dialectical method. What resulted in Cambodia under the CPK was a kind of dialectical voluntarism rather than materialism. All omitted from the revolutionary flag's review of dialectical materialism were all the materialist sections, Stalin's discussions of the material nature of the world, the primacy of matter, objective truth, modes of production, productive forces, and relations of production. All of those were admitted, omitted. What the CPK apparently considered more important than these objective conditions was the subjective method or approach or tactics to be adopted. So we shall now turn to the CPK's version. The first point of what Stalin called the Marxist dialectical method is that all phenomena are organically interrelated. Revo revolutionary flags noted this and then gave what it said was an example to quote, illustrate the law of dialectical materialism. This example is revealing. It says, example, in the situation of a person who has injured, injured a buffalo's leg, we must analyze. We must ask if the child or the old man who tends the animal injured it or who else did. And if it was done, why? Was it unintentional or was it to oppose the cooperative? Look for a person who has something to do with this matter. The cow herd. What composition, what background is he? What class stand, what political stand? Which milieu is his stand in contact with? We follow up, following up is a measure. If we cannot find out in one or two days, we will find out in two or three days." Unquote. In this way, the first feature of the Marxist dialectical method that all phenomena are organically interrelated became in CPK ideology the rationale for a witch hunt. Such CPK witch hunts are indeed reminiscent of Stalin's campaigns against wreckers who allegedly sabotaged production lines in the USSR in the 1930s. And there is a kind of mechanical materialism in the CPK's preoccupation with the class background of suspects displayed in the quotation. But overshadowing this perhaps is the CPK's firmly held, if degenerate philosophy of voluntarism. Its assumption being that if people have correct consciousness, any objective or material obstacles can be overcome. In fact, revolutionary flags instructed people to, quote, pull out weeds, add water and fertilizer by pushing the socialist revolutionary consciousness and stance. Still close, closely following Stalin's outline of the dialectical method, revolutionary flags goes on to note its second and third features that everything undergoes transformation and that this includes transformation from quantity to quality. And revolutionary flags then says, this attitude is evolving. Some point it will not stay correct with consciousness. It will become a concrete action. Consciousness will not remain still. We must beware not to let the consciousness change into a quantity. What's striking about this quotation are the final words into a quantity, which contrast with Stalin's predicted change to quality. In other words, they've changed Stalin's meaning and also turned it into a witch hunt for people who uh, will stay, will become incorrect. The, Marxist idea of social being determines consciousness 
has become a metaphysical one, uh, accumulated attitudes determine concrete action. We may presume that this represents another deliberate CPK departure from the theory stated just a few lines earlier in the article. We see it again with the statement in revolutionary flags, for instance, quote, a bud of material property, do not nurse it, eliminate it immediately. Therefore, we will be masters over ourselves. Another statement in revolutionary flags is if we have a life and death contradiction, we cannot think it is an internal contradiction. Now, this is an interesting difference from what Mao had chosen to warn against. Mao wrote in an instructive contrast to the CPK statement, those with a left way of thinking magnify contradictions between ourselves and the enemy to such an extent that they take certain contradictions among the people for contradictions with the enemy and regard as counter-revolutionaries persons who are not really counter-revolutionaries. Now that risk is not the one spelled out by revolutionary flags in the CPK regime. By Mao's criteria, the CPK committed an error and adopted a left way of thinking. The CPK leaders obviously did not consider it so dangerous for their party to treat an internal contradiction as a life and death one. It was of course very dangerous for the society, especially one run by a bureaucratic and rigidly hierarchical party whose cadres would feel safer overfilling, over fulfilling their quotas of contradictions resolved rather than under fulfilling them. One slogan of this period in DK used to describe policy towards urban evacuees was consistent with the view that there was little danger in mistaking internal contradictions for life and death ones. This slogan was, quote, spare them no profit, remove them no loss, unquote. This chilling epigram was quite unique, even for the more ruthless communist re regimes. We also have a statement in revolutionary flags that is quite anti-materialist. It goes, quote, technology is not a determining factor. The determining factors of the revolution are politics, revolutionary people, and the revolutionary system. This statement obviously owes a great deal to Maoist ideology, which had a preference for, quote, red over, quote, expert, but it's expressed here in a very simplistic form. But it's a very different statement, and could we have the next slide, please? Very different statement from that of the Cambodian Marxist Hu Yun, who wrote in 1964, just over a decade before the Khmer Rouge took power, that social change and technological advancement should go together. Hu Yun wrote, our country, just like any other in the world, must advance. Economic progress must be built on the foundation of modern technology. Given our country's qualities, how can we introduce modern technology to increase production? We cannot ignore modern technology, which must be applied in one way or another in agriculture. Modern technology is much more efficient than the old methods. We will now discuss the methods which technology can introduce to further our two goals. That is increasing production by increasing the forces of production and solving the problems relating to human beings, social problems. In a number of non-socialist countries, the exploitation of farmland has been assisted by modern methods. Agricultural production has increased tremendously because agricultural machinery and science have challenged the power of nature. But a number of peasants have descended into the ranks of agricultural laborers, living by selling their labor. The introduction of modern technology seems to place a heavy burden on the necks of the workers. Cooperative methods can solve both these aspects of the rural problem in the interests of the peasants by full use of scientific and technological methods. 
and also by increasing the standard of living of the workers. Cooperatives support the workers so that they become the masters of their lives, their possessions and their works. Politics and technology must be combined for sound cooperative development. There should be a plan to diffuse widely technical knowledge throughout the people's environment. Now, this Marxist vision of co peasant cooperatives could not be more distant from the CPK's vision of Cambodia's peasantry, for whom, quote, technology is not a determining factor, unquote. A member of the CPK Central Committee from 1971, Hu Yun was already speaking out against CPK Centre policies. In 1970, he had dared to scold Pol Pot claiming that the centre was using his name as a screen. In 1971 and 72, Hu Yun opposed the centre's plans for collectivisation, elimination of markets, evacuation of towns, and attacks on Vietnamese troops. In 1974 and early 75, as the centre finalised its plans for the evacuation of Phnom Penh, Hu Yun opposed them, as well as opposing plans to repress Buddhism and abolish money. He then pursued his dissent immediately after the capital city's evacuation. At a meeting in Phnom Penh on May 20th, 1975, Pol Pot ordered, among other things, the creation of high level cooperatives throughout the country with communal eating in barracks or mess halls. A witness reported that Hu Yun spoke up and said that this was just not possible. The country had just emerged from a war, so there were great shortages and a lack of capital and facilities. Hu Yun said communal eating cooperatives throughout the country was not a feasible proposition. After that, Hu Yun was sacked from the cabinet. Indeed, his oppositional stance made Hu Yun one of the first targets of the CPK center. After liberation, according to Hu Nim, another minister, when the party abolished money and wages and evacuated the people, Hu Yun again boldly took a stand against the party line. He criticized the plan to turn pagodas into stables. Hu Yun apparently survived until August 1975, when according to a report from a CPK cadre, Hu Yun addressed a large gathering of evacuees and others on the Mekong River in Kompong Chang province. He spoke out strongly against the evacuation and was applauded by the crowd. Soon after leaving this meeting, a CPK squad shot Hu Yun dead and threw his body into the Mekong. Three years later, a confidential CPK report confirmed, in 1975, we killed the contemptible Hu Yun. Hu Yun was a Marxist, but it's difficult to categorize him as a Stalinist or a Maoist. In 1964, he had argued that those he termed the little people must be able to hold their heads high and open their mouths freely as masters of the cooperatives for their own benefit. And he also emphasized the need for democratic processes in the organization of cooperatives. On the other hand, the CPK Center too departed significantly from both Stalinism and Maoism, while it shared some characteristics with Nazism. What perhaps is most striking about the CPK's ideology and practice is that it included a combination of elements shared by all three, Nazism, Stalinism, and Maoism. It's perhaps not surprising then that one of the first victims of the CPK, along with many thousands of other Cambodians, was a Marxist whose record suggests that he had far less in common with any of these three 20th century totalitarian ideologies. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Kern. Uh, it was a really insightful uh, lecture and thanks uh, for the uh, informations that you had provided. Professor Kernan had uh, throughout his life uh, he had uh, researched on Southeast Asia and had, he's one of the scholars who had worked uh, in, the, in several, in, in uh, 
in publishing uh, articles and scholarship on the Khmer Rouge. And today the world knows uh, about the atrocities that happened in Khmer Rouge at, and Professor Kernan, uh, through Professor Kernan's research. And it was really great to hear from you, Professor, further insights and uh, other in informations that you provided. I hope like uh, the viewers uh, have definitely questions for Professor Kernan and like other speakers. We will be having a Q&A session at the end, but for now we would be uh, going. To, uh, we would be. We would like to pass pass uh, pass our float to Professor Omar Bertov, who would be speaking on uh, on his like on his upcoming. He would he would be speaking on the lecture. So Professor Bertov, the stage is yours. Thank you very much, and thank you very much for hosting this event. Uh, thanks very much uh, to Ben for his really interesting lecture. Um, <clears throat> I will try to talk today uh, about a very uh, large genocide, um, possibly the largest genocide in the 20th century, but to talk about it uh, through uh, two different uh, perspectives. One, which would be the larger context within which it occurred, and the second would be its local aspects. Um, what I will be talking about is, is the Holocaust, uh, particularly uh, in this sense, the so-called final solution of the Jewish question, the genocide of the European Jews. Um, but as I say, I would like to talk about it from a somewhat different perspective. Um, what I've um, called this talk is the reality and memory of local genocide in World War II Ukraine and its repercussions uh, for the present. Um, so the focus here is on uh, events uh, related to the Holocaust that occurred in an area <clears throat> which we now know as West Ukraine. Um, and of course, many of you, I'm sure, now following the news uh, are much more familiar with the map of Ukraine than you may have been a, a year ago. Uh, unfortunately, uh, so to speak, history has come back and many of the sites, places, cities and towns that uh, people who studied World War II uh, familiar with, but were unfamiliar to most people not living there or not studying this area, are now known again. Uh, and there are some interesting links between what happened in the past in those areas and what is happening there right now. Uh, so in that sense, one can say that one thing we are learning is that history has a nasty habit of returning. Um, this area of West Ukraine uh, for most of its history, it was not under Ukrainian or Russian rule. Uh, and that is one context that is interesting to contemplate here in terms of what occurred uh, during World War II. Um, before World War I, that is before 1914, uh, West Ukraine was part of the uh, Austro-Hungarian Empire, uh, formerly the Habsburg Empire. Uh, and it had been under uh, Austrian rule uh, since the last third of the 18th century. Uh, before that, I, I won't go into the complicated history that preceded that, but in 1772, this area that had belonged to the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth was annexed by Austria, by the Austrian Empire, and was given the name uh, Galicia or Galicia or Galician. Uh, and the eastern part of this area, which is what comprises now West Ukraine, uh, had a majority population of Ukrainians. They were not known at the time as Ukrainians, but more either as peasants or as Ruthenians. But to simplify matters, we'll speak of them as Ukrainians. So the majority of the population there were Ukrainians. The second largest group in that area were Poles and a large minority, over 10% of the population were Jews. Uh, and so when this area comes under Austrian rule, um, 
the conditions under which they live change because now they find themselves uh, under a monarchy that is uh, trying to create a more uh, well-ordered administrative uh, bureaucratic system uh, to control a new population that it has just taken in. Uh, why am I uh, talking about this early period uh, in, in contextualizing what happened in that area in World War II? Well, because until the latter part of the 19th century, these three population groups, the Poles who were Roman Catholics, the Ukrainians who were Greek Catholic, and the Jews who, who were Jewish by religion as well, uh, lived side by side relatively uh, well. There was very little violence in that area. Uh, there were, of course, tensions that had to do with the different religions and the different socioeconomic uh, uh, positions of each group. Uh, but the violence that characterized this area in the 17th century largely disappeared. And in part, this was because this area was under Austrian rule. And the Austrian Empire was an empire made up of many, many different ethnic groups, many, many different uh, religions, uh, many different languages. And it became quite good at balancing uh, one group against each other, not in order to antagonize them, but in order to maintain order within this vast um, multi-ethnic, multi-religious empire. But in the latter part of the 19th century, uh, this area experiences what much of Europe had experienced already before, which is the rise of nationalism. And the kind of nationalism that appears in this area is, an ethno, is ethno nationalism. That is, it's a nationalism that identifies between a particular ethnic group, however that ethnic group is defined, uh, and the nation. Uh, and it is also, it's not only ethno-nationalism, it's ethno-territorial nationalism. That is, it speaks about a particular ethnic group that is now should be identified as a nation, and as that nation, ethnic group, uh, identified with a particular territory. Um, and the result of the rise of this kind of nationalism, which characterizes both uh, the Polish population in that area, uh, and Ukrainians in that area, is that the kind of more traditional antagonism between different groups and different religions is now translated not only into a political terminology, uh, but also into a competition over the very space in which they live. That is the question is uh, who belongs to that area uh, and, uh, and which area belongs to which group? Uh, as I said, there are three groups in this area. Uh, the third group are the Jews. Uh, the Jews are quite slow in uh, adopting uh, nationalism. It, and ethno nationalism and ethno territorial nationalism doesn't really sit well with Jewish traditions uh, in Europe. But eventually, uh, nationalism appears also among the Jewish population, and by the late 19th century, early 20th century, on the eve of World War I, uh, many of the Jews in this area adopt also ethno-nationalism with the uh, major distinction uh, that while it is ethno-nationalist, that is, it identifies Jews as a nation uh, rather than as a people, a tradition, and a religion, uh, the territory that it claims is not the territory on which the Jews in that area or in other areas of Europe actually reside, but rather it becomes Zionism. And therefore the territory that it identifies as the territory of its destiny as a nation is in Palestine rather than where the Jews live. Now the result of this process in the last decades leading to World War I is that there is growing uh, um, rhetorical antagonism between, uh, particularly between Poles and Ukrainians as they compete uh, rhetorically over who actually should rule this area. 
the the Ukrainian narrative in this area is that this is uh, that they are the indigenous population of West Ukraine, uh, as it is referred to, or East Galicia, as it is formally at that point under um, uh, Austrian rule, or as it comes to be known after World War One, is Eastern Poland. That they are the indigenous population, and that the Poles had come to that area. Uh, centuries earlier and colonized it uh, and used them uh, to their own purposes as peasants, as serfs, uh, to work the land, to enrich the Polish nobility that took over the land. And a, a, a kind of secondary aspect of this uh, historical view, historical narrative, is that the Poles had brought the Jews there to do their work for them as their lackeys. That is, that the Jews were working for the Poles in the exploitation of the indigenous Ukrainian population. And that's a narrative that becomes increasingly uh, predominant, uh, particularly among nationalizers, that is, among the intellectuals, uh, priests, uh, those uh, members of the elite of uh, Ukrainian society in that area that are trying to persuade the peasants that they are, in fact, a people. Um, rather than just people who live there in their villages uh, and who happen to be Greek Catholic. The, the Polish narrative is uh, one of what we could call a civilizing mission. That is, the Poles present themselves to themselves and to others as those who came to these savage areas, uh, found um, um, primitive people who are related to them, who speak a similar language, who are Slavs, just as they are, uh, and they came to develop them, to develop these areas, to build cities, to build commerce, uh, and to make it into a part of the greater um, uh, Polish realm. Um, and so for Poles, uh, in many ways, Ukrainians are seen within this Polish uh, national narrative of the time, as potentially people who could become like the Poles under the beneficial um, 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 civilizing uh, impact of Polish rule. Um, for both groups, uh, the Jews are somewhat of a problem. It is true that historically Jews were brought to this area, invited to this area uh, by the Polish aristocracy in order to create commerce there. Uh, and they came from uh, initially from Central Europe, from Germany, and later from the uh, more traditional part, the central part of Poland, into these areas that were being colonized by the Poles to develop cities and commerce. Um, and they were given a variety of privileges, monopolies over the production of um, bread, uh, production of alcohol, and so forth, so as to entice them to come to these areas. But within this new uh, ethno-national discourse, uh, the Jews are a problem. For Ukrainians, they're seen as people who had uh, done the job for the colonizing Poles, and for Poles, they're seen as disloyal to the new Polish narrative that speaks about creating a Poland for Poles. Um, and so, in many ways, the, the Jewish response to that is, as I said, to create uh, the Jews' own national narrative, uh, which is one that the Jews are a nation, um, and as a nation, they should go back to their own land, to the land from which they had been um, uh, exiled uh, 2,000 years earlier, which as they find out, that's another topic, when they get there, is actually not empty, but inhabited. And so in many ways, they import uh, this ethno-national rhetoric and antagonism from Europe uh, to the Middle East, uh, a conflict that is still, of course, ongoing. Now, all of this is happening uh, uh, without much violence until 1914, uh, largely because, as I said, the area is ruled by the Austrian Empire. Uh, and the Austrian Empire is agrees to allow different nations to develop their own identity, but uh, does not allow uh, for, for any um, um, military conflict, uh, violent conflict to break out. 
And he does so rather effectively, despite the impression that we have of the Austrian Empire as being sort of uh, bumbling and disintegrating. But in World War I, all this changes. And the war itself is extremely violent and brings a great deal of violence to these parts of Europe, to um, uh, East Galicia, to, to this region. Uh, the armies that fight there are themselves multi-ethnic armies, both, both the Russian army and the Austrian army are made up of many different nationalities. The Russians who take over this area in World War I, both between 1914 and 1915, and then again in 1916 to 1917, uh, have a particularly vicious policy against the Jewish populations there, although generally their rule is quite brutal. Uh, Cossack units in particular are engaged in wide, in, in, in wide ranging pogroms against Jewish populations, which is seen by the rest of the population. That is that now uh, people living there can see that there is a license by the powers that be, by those who rule them, to exert violence against a particular group of people. There is also growing tension between Poles and Ukrainians because of the, 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 the sense that at the end of the war, hopefully these two groups will be liberated from Austrian rule. And they are in fact fighting within the Austrian army, but they're not really fighting for maintaining the Austrian uh, empire, but rather with the hope of creating their own nation state. And at the end of the war, when the Austrian Empire collapses, what in fact occurs is that uh, there is a struggle over that territory of East Galicia, now also known as West Ukraine, uh, between uh, Polish military organizations and Ukrainian military organizations. So now the, the, the um, antagonistic uh, nationalist rhetoric of the pre-World War I period is translated into actual violence. And that violence is not only uh, um, targeting soldiers, but also a great deal of violence against civilian populations. And it should be understood that in areas such as that, as in many other parts of the world, where you have mixed populations, mixed ethnicities and religions, there is a fair amount of overlap between these groups. They are never quite distinct. Uh, they speak uh, close languages, they have similar customs, and they often intermarry. And so the, the violence that occurs, occurs not only within villages, say, between Poles and Ukrainians, but also within families, uh, which are identified as partly Polish and partly Ukrainian. And another element of this violence is that the Jewish population there is immediately identified by each side as being on the side of the other. And so there are also um, uh, quite serious pogroms against Jews that continue during uh, the war between the Poles and the Ukrainians. Uh, and particularly a large pogrom that occurs in the city of Lemberg, uh, as its German name is Lwów, as it's known in Polish, and Viv, as it's known in Ukrainian which is now again back in the news, although now it's almost a purely Ukrainian city. Now, after this struggle in um, 1918, 1919, this area comes under Polish rule. The, the, the Poles win, win that, that struggle. And this becomes now East Poland between the two world wars. And if we are to understand the kind of energies that are released uh, the violent energies that are released during World War II, during the Holocaust, we need to understand this kind of background. Uh, that is, that under Polish rule, uh, uh, the Polish nation state, which in this area is still, uh, ethnically speaking, uh, the Poles are still a minority in this area of uh, East Poland. Uh, the Polish state tries to suppress as much as it can Polish nationalism, and it tries to colonize this area by bringing more Poles from central Poland to settle uh, under beneficial terms uh, in this area of East Poland, West Ukraine. Uh, that creates growing antagonism among the Ukrainian population and leads to the creation in 1929 
of a Ukrainian nationalist organization called the Organization of Ukrainian Nationalists, known under the um, the the the, uh, the term OUN, O U N, um, and that organization uh, pledges to create a poll-free and Jew-free Ukraine uh, once it can win the struggle uh, against uh, the Polish state. Um, it is associated with other fascist organizations in Eastern Europe. And after the rise of um, the takeover of Germany by the Nazis in 1933, uh, it develops uh, close relations with the Third Reich, with Nazi Germany, and uh, fighters, activists of the OUN uh, are trained in uh, Germany. The Germans, of course, have their own plans of, for what they would do uh, with this radical organization. Uh, so there, there is an ongoing struggle between uh, Ukrainian nationalists and the Polish state during the 1920s and 1930s. And after 1935, with the death of the authoritarian Polish leader uh, in, in Poland, there is a rise in, in uh, extreme right-wing uh, organizations in Poland, which happen to be also extremely anti-Semitic. And they basically speak increasingly about ridding Poland of the Jews. So the Jewish population in this area finds itself trapped between uh, Ukrainian nationalism uh, that is mostly uh, anti-Polish, but also wants to create a Jew-free Ukraine and Polish nationalism that is mostly in this area about suppressing uh, Ukrainian nationalism, but becomes increasingly also uh, anti-Semitic, uh, passing a variety of anti-Semitic rules and regulations. Um, so th this is very important to understand when we want to see what happens in World War II. The last uh, element that I will mention here is what occurs in this area between 1939 and 1941. World War II breaks out in 1939, uh, but what facilitates uh, the, the outbreak of World War II is an agreement between Nazi Germany and Soviet Stalinist Russia. Uh, and that agreement means that Russia, that Germany uh, can have uh, a freedom of action uh, initially against Poland without fearing a clash with Soviet Russia. And Soviet Russia gets out of it uh, an agreement with Nazi Germany that it will take over large parts of Eastern Europe that would not be taken over by the Nazis. So that on the 1st of September, 1939, uh, Germany invades uh, Poland, and on the 17th of September, uh, the Red Army marches into the eastern parts of Poland, uh, as well as Belarus, and takes it over. Uh, and so between 1939 and 1941, uh, this area of, of East Galicia is now ruled uh, by the Soviets, and that's for the first time, apart from the occupation of World War I, that this area is under Russian, or in this case, Soviet rule. And the Soviets used their own um, uh, uh, system of integrating uh, this area, first by um, nationalizing the economy, which leads to immense shortages in, in this area to the point uh, that, in fact, there is not enough food in the area. And secondly, by, by pursuing its real and imaginary enemies, uh, and deporting very large numbers of people, uh, Poles, Jews, and Ukrainians. Uh, the Soviets also decapitate these groups, meaning they, they arrest and often kill the elites of these groups. So this greatly heightens uh, the tension between the, the three ethnic groups in this area, uh, each of which sees the other as cooperating with now what becomes the new enemy uh, the Soviet Union. So on the 22nd of June, 1941, when the Nazis invade this area uh, and break, of course, their agreement, their alliance with the Soviet Union by attacking it, um, all hell breaks loose. Uh, and what we find is that as the Red Army is retreating, even before uh, the German armed forces, the Wehrmacht, enter this area, 
there's a wide uh, ranging pogroms throughout this area. There's mass killing uh, of Jewish populations in towns and cities by the local population, largely by Ukrainian mobs, as well as nationalists, organized nationalists who hail back to the organization I mentioned, the OUN of the 1920s and 30s. Uh, the, part of the reason for that is that the Soviets, before they retreat from this area, uh, murder large numbers of political prisoners that were in local prisons uh, because um, they, they have the choice of either taking them with them or killing them. And as they're retreating very quickly, they're basically running away from the Germans. They use the easiest solution and they just shoot large numbers of political prisoners, most of whom are Ukrainian. And that is associated now by the population as an action by Judeo-Bolsheviks. That is, the Jews are associated with the Soviets, both because of prejudices that exist in this area since World War I, and because this is the Nazi rhetoric that is now being spread over into this area. Now, when the Germans take over this area, and after they move on, the, the German army moves on into the rest of the Soviet Union, they leave a very thin, uh, thinly manned apparatus, police apparatus in this area, uh, security police. And these security police outposts that are throughout this region are charged basically with one thing. They need to murder all the Jewish population in that area. Now there's very few of them. So in the area that I studied of, of one town called Buchach and another called Chotkov, there were approximately 60,000 Jews were murdered there. That's the vast majority of the Jews who were living there uh, between um, uh, summer uh, and early fall of 1942 and early summer 1943. And the people who were charged with killing them were 20 uh, policemen of the German security police. Uh, now, obviously 20 policemen could not kill uh, 60,000 uh, human beings uh, living in a large area uh, in smallish towns separated by large empty spaces. And so the way that this was carried out by the Germans was by recruiting uh, local activists. Um, as I said, when the Soviets retreat from this area, uh, there, there is a great deal of violence. Much of it is directed by Ukrainian militias. These are nationalist militias that uh, say, now we can finally create an independent Ukraine. But of course, then the Germans come. And the Germans convert these nationalist militias into auxiliary police units. And it is these auxiliary police units that number not a couple of scores of men, but hundreds of men who are well armed and trained that facilitate this mass killing of the local Jewish population. So in a sense, what the Germans do as, and as they did in uh, carrying out genocide throughout Europe, they adapt themselves to the local uh, circumstances and the local circumstances in this area uh, that there are already militias. These militias do want to hope to create an independent Ukraine. They believe that Ukraine should be emptied of Jews. And now the Germans come and they believe that if they cooperate with them in doing what they themselves would like to see, that is uh, getting rid of the Jews, they would reap political benefits out of this cooperation. Now, they do not reap these political benefits, uh, but they do uh, facilitate uh, the killing. In 1943 and 1944, when it becomes clear that the Red Army is returning, that the Germans are not going to hold on to this area, uh, these same nationalist organizations change their politics. For one thing, most of the Jewish population now is gone. Most of them have been murdered. Uh, and for another, uh, there is now yet another element that has to be cleared and for which there is an opportunity now uh, to act against, and that is the Polish population. So now these militias that had worked closely with the Germans as police forces uh, 
begin, de begin deserting from these police forces and form a, uh, a, uh, an army. It's uh, known as the UPA, is the Ukrainian insurgent army, uh, whose main goal is to, first of all, uh, ethnically cleanse this area of the Polish population. Now, unlike the cooperation with the Germans in the murder of the Jews, in which case the Germans and the Ukrainians are on the same page, in this case, the Germans have no interest in ethnically cleansing the Poles. This is not part of their own program. Uh, at this point, they're, they're just trying to hold on to the territory that they conquered. Uh, and so this operation of ethnic cleansing, which is an extremely brutal population of intimidation and murder of villages, of Polish villages in another province known as Volinia, which uh, overlaps with Belarus and uh, Galicia, uh, uh, this operation is basically run uh, only by Ukrainians. Uh, we, we're speaking about up to 100,000 uh, people who die in, in, in this operation. The Poles fight back. So there is also a great deal of violence exerted by the Poles against uh, Poly, uh, Ukrainian population. So by the end of this huge historical cycle, uh, when the Red Army returns, uh, and the Red Army suppresses the insurgency uh, that goes on by the Ukrainian nationalists. And by 1946, 47, uh, most of the insurgency has been suppressed. Most of the Poles, if they have not been ethnically cleansed, are then moved out of this area through a population exchange. And most of the Jews, even those who survived the mass killings of 1942, 43, and were in hiding, uh, have been hunted down and killed. By the end of this huge cycle, we find a situation that has, for the first time uh, since recorded history in this area, has simplified the population, has unmixed the population. We have now a new Poland that is created. Much of it, Poland is being moved to the West. Uh, that is, Eastern Poland becomes part of Ukraine and Eastern Germany becomes part of Poland, and most of the population there is Polish. Uh, the three million Jews who had lived in Poland uh, are no longer living. And of the 200,000 Jews who returned to Poland at that point, uh, most of them leave shortly thereafter because there's still pogroms in Poland after the end of the war and after the Holocaust. So most of them flee further west. Ukraine, West Ukraine, which was this area of mixed populations at least since the 16th century, uh, now is purely uh, Ukrainian. There's hardly any Jews or any uh, Poles left there. Uh, now that area then comes under Soviet rule. And in just in the last couple of minutes, I'll mention the post-war politics of memory of all this. Uh, the Soviets, uh, um, um, who were engaged in a very brutal suppression of the Ukrainian insurgency, the last attempt by Ukrainians to have an independent state. Um, once they have taken over and uh, done away with the insurgency, um, they uh, will not allow any talk of this kind of uh, proud Ukrainian nationalism. Uh, and they speak of uh, the Ukrainian population there is having fought together as, as brave uh, Soviet citizens against fascist rule. And there were, of course, some bad apples, some collaborators with the fascists, uh, but by and large, the Soviet uh, line for the next 40 years is that the population has fought bravely against uh, Nazi rule. Uh, and when they speak about the civilian victims in this area, they speak of them as Soviet citizens. There's hardly any mention of the fact that there was a particular program of genocide against the Jews in which much of the local population, or at least nationalists uh, from the local population had participated and had been highly instrumental in implementing. Uh, and this remains the rhetoric for 40 years, well into the 1980s. Once uh, the communist system collapses and independent Ukraine is created in 1991, 
Then finally, people, particularly in West Ukraine, who have maintained these memories of what had occurred, but could never articulate them, could never express them under Soviet rule, but were expressing them in exile, um, Ukrainian nationalist exiles in North America, in Canada, in the United States, and in Britain as well. Now they can finally revive these memories of heroism. And so the local memory now changes dramatically to a memory of Ukrainian nationalists who had fought bravely uh, to uh, create an independent Ukraine, had lost in that battle, but now their memory has to be revived. The only difficulty with this memory, of course, is that these same people who had indeed fought bravely against uh, Polish rule, against uh, Soviet rule, and in part toward the end also against German rule, uh, had also participated in mass crimes, uh, both in the genocide of the Jews and in the ethnic cleansing of the Poles. And so that memory is suppressed. Uh, and um, ironically, it is the suppression of this memory that is since February uh, has been used uh, by the Kremlin to justify its own uh, in, uh, in entirely illegal and criminal invasion uh, of Ukraine by saying that the uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine is in order to denazify it. Uh, that is that Ukraine history was all a history of collaboration uh, with the Nazis. So, that instead of having used the opportunity over the years since 1991 to actually confront this past, this very complex and difficult past, uh, in which Ukraine was both uh, exploited and, um, and invaded uh, and um, uh, used by all the powers around it, uh, but to talk also about the cooperation between Ukraine and national of the time and the Germans to confront that past because that was not done. Uh, Ukraine was left open to this kind of propaganda by the Kremlin uh, to justify the unjustifiable. So I'll stop here and I hope that there will be questions later on. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you so thank you so much, uh, Professor Bertov. Uh, the memory of uh, genocide uh, is indeed an alarming narrative in today's Ukraine, uh, with the ongoing crisis and uh, the fear of a uh, genocide and atrocities on Ukrainian population is uh, all across international uh, international communities and people. Uh, we don't know if it's a stage of genocide or not, uh, which is currently happening in Ukraine. We hope it's not, but uh, history, as you referred, have a nasty habit of repeating and every war brings extermination of families and uh, populations. And this, is, and this is how, you know, genocide happens uh, again and again, rather being never again. So this is the thing. Uh, so we would definitely have questions and uh, for now, we would be we would like to invite our last speaker, Professor Hannibal Travis, for his lecture, and his lecture titles: "Genocide in the Middle East: Conquest, Revenge, and Security." Uh, over to you, Professor Travis. Okay, thank you, Sumava. I'm I'm pleased to see so many people in attendance, and I'm honored to be on the same panel as Ben and Omer. Uh, I'd like to share my screen if I can. It's currently disabled. Could we enable my screen sharing? Still disabled on my side. I think oh, I got it. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so you just heard the title. Um, Genocide in the Middle East, Conquest, Revenge, and Security, based in part upon my uh, on my 2010 book and, and a 2018 sort of sequel uh, that was mentioned in my introduction. Um, to start with the document, uh, I thought was interesting, um, sort of rare, from 1915 from the American ambassador in Constantinople, uh, Morgenthau, 
uh, to the Secretary of State um, following up on a previous communication about deportation of an excesses against peaceful Armenians. Uh, he said this was increasing and it appears to be a campaign of race extermination in progress under a pretext of reprisal against rebellion. This is probably one of the first documents of the 20th century that refers to a campaign of race extermination. Uh, there were some documents in the German parliament and so forth about the Herero, uh, the Nama uh, in uh, what is today Namibia, German Southwest Africa. Uh, probably there are some documents about the Boers in South Africa um, suffering an, an ethnic campaign. Uh, and a few others, probably. There are quite a few documents about the Armenians of the late 19th century, so that, that sort of carries over into the early 20th century. But this is one of the first documents you see in the, in the uh, 20th century about a, uh, what we would today call a genocidal campaign, uh, a campaign against a group to, to deport it, deprive it of its homeland, harass it, and uh, including the peaceful population. Uh, and he, it was also interesting that he mentioned intervention in, in the last part of his uh, dispatch saying uh, nothing short of actual force, which obviously we as the United States not in a position to exert uh, would be adequate for this situation. It's so great. Uh, after uh, some years later uh, in 1919, the United States sent a military mission to investigate conditions in what they called Armenia uh, but also includes what Kurds would call Kurdistan and Turkey calls Kurt Turkey um, and what uh, Assyrians or Assyro-Chaldeans would call Assyro-Chaldea or Assyro-Chaldee. Uh, they're overlapping groups in this area. Anyway, this, uh, this um, uh, General Harbert um, issued a report about what people said in that area uh, post World War One. So now World War One is over, so they can sort of do an investigation. Uh, there was an investigation of German crimes um, and German aggression, they called it. Uh, and and this is part of the investigation on the the other side of of the uh, the Central Powers sort of domain: Germany, Austria, Hungary, and and Ottoman Empire. Uh, the Armenian side. And he said, what happened was massacres and, and deportations were organized in the spring of 1915 according to a definite system. In other words, deliberate and systematic. Um, and many people subject to this perished from thirst or were killed uh, either before the marches or on the way. Um, of the female refugees, 40% were infected by venereal disease which in that time was pretty uncommon in sort of Eastern Ottoman Empire and Arab nations. Um, they, were, they were not as urban as today. They were sort of gender segregated and there was very little dating. So how this had happened was, well, the, the soldiers and, and the, the allied militia had been, uh, of course, abusing the deportees and, and the people of their communities um, in, a, in a very large scale fashion. Um, and surely the report sort of added no faith had been cherished at a greater cost than this Christian faith in Anatolia. Uh, they addressed the issue of, of Ottoman security. So of course the, the Ottomans had told the, um, the American ambassador, the German ambassador, the Austro-Hungarian ambassador, the Italian ambassador, the other ambassadors um, that we had to do um, security measures in the eastern part of our um, empire, northeastern part, uh, because we were being invaded by Russia and they were using local Armenians as a militia. Uh, they were going to attack our forces from the rear with the Armenians, the Armenian Revolutionary Organization, the Socialists of Armenia, uh, socialists and sort of nationalists, um, Hunchaks and, and Dashnaks. Um, and so therefore we had to uh, relocate the populations in which these uh, socialists were sort of swimming like fish in the sea of the civilian population. And uh, there was some local fighting, you know, 
Armenians were setting off bombs um, and, and stockpiling weapons. We had to do like house to house raids, like, you know, the war on terror. Um, so this was all perfectly normal. The same thing you would do Americans in the Philippines, same thing as you would do British in India or some other place. Um, same things you, the Russians, would do in your territory, uh, and so forth. Uh, however, this uh, American military mission report says, to the extent that there was an Armenian uprising, it was provoked through acts of oppression by Turkish officials and soldiery. The famous Armenian revolution was merely the determination of the Armenians to save their women's honor and their own lives after the Turks, by massacring thousands of their neighbors, had shown them the fate that awaited them. So there are, they are exercising resistance. Uh, like there's this movie, Defiance, about, I believe it's Ukraine, about uh, the, the Bielski group of, of Jews um, resisting Nazi uh, conquest and genocide uh, rather than having a, a pre-existing anti-German revolution. They were sort of civilians who take up arms to save their communities. This is kind of what they're talking about 30 years previously in the, in the Eastern Ottoman Empire, Northeastern. Um, even a colonel from a, a general's uh, staff of the Ottoman Empire had informed this American general that it, the Armenians of Mosul had to be massacred and it was intention to do so. Um, 55,000 Armenians were killed in the vicinity of Van, according to Avon, according to the U.S. Ambassador Morgenthau. Bearing the title militia, irregulars and bands of marauders were organized in a military fashion. They are being blamed for a numerous plunders, murders, uh, robbery, and other acts committed against the Armenian population of the country. So a plundering scheme, uh, another American called it at the time. And uh, some of these documents are German, some of them are, are American, but it it goes to the uh, the uprising being a, uh, a series of resistance efforts um, after the Turks were massacring the local Christian population, which other documents, including the Ottoman documents, suggest they were doing to get revenge upon Russia and the West uh, for opposing them. Um, so uh, there was a report during the war, treatment of Armenians in the Ottoman Empire, uh, which was a joint effort of the uh, British ambassador to the United States uh, and the Oxford historian Arnold Toynbee uh, gathering documents from correspondence to various newspapers, uh, submissions to the British uh, consuls and so forth, uh, even like Italian and Austrian newspaper articles and so forth. And they gathered all this together uh, in, in a blue book uh, which was a thing they did also for like German aggression and for other things that happened in the war, Belgium. Um, they, they would gather an anthology of evidence, um, sort of like we would have today a UN inquiry or something um, that would summarize all this, but they just published the original sort of raw material uh, with an introductory analysis, which is more similar to what we would see today from the UN. Uh, and this report said uh, from, uh, from an Assyrian um, correspondent, first, the, they being the Ottomans killed the men, then they took the women, those who had not escaped and carried them off, and finally they plundered and burned the villages. The German ambassador also was, was writing secretly. They, there were these German cables that were published in 1919 um, in what is today Berlin, basically uh, by a German humanitarian and, and Ottoman expert and, and sort of Christian pro evangelist. Um, he gathers these German archival files and, and cables into a, a, an anthology and publishes them. And one of these documents says the German ambassador said that the interior minister of the Ottoman Empire told a German embassy official that the indigenous Christians would be cleansed under the cover of war. Um, and I've pointed out that, that this, this metaphor of cleansing is, is the same one used by Nazis. They were going to make a clean sweep of Germany, especially of the Jews, but also sometimes they talk about Slavs and Asiatics in general were gonna be swept away. Uh, Germany will be cleaned up, not just Germany, German occupied areas. Um, there would be maybe remnants or reservations of the Asiatics 
but the the cities, you know, that's why they had ghettos and and segregation and deportation, um, and uh, Rex commissariats and all that stuff was to uh, sort of separate the cleaned Aryan uh, empire from the remaining Asiatic pockets of of Jews, Slavs, Roma, Sinti people. Um, there's also some, uh, you know, African Europeans that were, that were victimized and, and other groups. Uh, the Times of London also had an interesting report about this, where we talked about 250,000 Assyrians falling victim alongside the Armenians, saying that inspired by fanaticism and by their hatred of the Christians, the Turkish government made a shambles uh, out of our country and out of a large part of Mesopotamia inhabited by the Chaldeans. So to explain it a little bit, the Assyrians and Chaldeans, um, in ancient times, there, there were a succession of empires in Mesopotamia, uh, Sumerians, Akkadians, um, Assyrians, Chaldeans, and finally Persians, uh, Achaemenids, and then Sasanians. Um, and the Assyrians and the Chaldeans often um, lived in the same place and were deported from place to place. So they're like an overlapping group. Uh, and also there were Armenians among them and uh, proto-Arabs and uh, Arameans. So the, uh, the Northern side is more typically of Mesopotamia, nor more typically called Assyria. The Southern side called Chaldea. Babylon is Chaldea, Nineveh is Assyria. So when they talk about Assyrians and Chaldeans, uh, in this context, they're kind of referring to them as the same thing. Uh, it it kind of depended on whether, whether you were Catholic or Protestant or, or pro-British or, or Orthodox or pro-Russian, because the Chaldeans were allied with France and Catholic, um, and the uh, Nestorians or Assyrians were more Orthodox uh, or uh, sort of proto-Protestant that the English thought, them, thought of them as being and um, called themselves Assyrians. So just to explain that part. So the Assyrian patriarch, his name is Mar Benyamin Shimun, Mar Shimun Benyamin, which means uh, the, the sort of Saint Simon um, with the name Benjamin. He took that name, like the Pope's take a name, uh, like Francis. And he's, he wrote that after the Kohen Jihad, the Turks decided to wipe us out like the Armenians and let us be attacked by their troops and by the Kurds among whom we live. At the end of May 1915, the official massacres and devastations in our villages began. Our people are now surrounded. Their food is in imminent danger of running out and there are epidemics. So the, the people, as the American military report said, were, were, were dying of deprivation uh, and also disease was spreading. Uh, but also there was a systematic policy of massacre. All these things together, Raphael Lemkin thought about as genocide. Uh, a series of acts aimed at the biological foundation of the group to sap its uh, reproduction and survival. Uh, this is a, a zoomed in map of that area, Eastern Anatolia, which they call Asiatic Turkey as opposed to European Turkey across the Bosphorus. And this part, Kurdistan, as you know, uh, bridges what is today Turkey, Iran, and Iraq, Mesopotamia. Um, so these Assyrians, this Assyrian patriarch was writing from this area, Hakkari Kochanis, which is the spiritual capital of Assyria, which according to Assyrian traditions, the Assyrians used to live closer to here, Nineveh, uh, Assyria, I told you, and they had to flee up this way because the Timurids had invaded and were killing all of the Christians in this area in the 13th and, and 14th century uh, so seven to 800 years ago, six to 700 years ago, before this time. Uh, I'm sorry, five to 600 years ago, uh, as of this time. Because um, this, this time is 100 years before our time. And um, so they were living in this area because this is like an impregnable mountain area of uh, where they lived in stone buildings, you know, stone churches or, or, or stone houses that were, uh, you know, e more easily defended than the plains of Nineveh, uh, which I'll come back to later. Uh, and so from here, they basically had to flee this way, east and north, um, towards northern Persia, then occupied by Russia, 
um, and some of them all the way into Russia on foot. Uh, and a lot of people died trying to walk this way. And then the Russians were sort of uh, diverted uh, and the Ottomans entered this area and people had to flee again. Um, some of them went up, some of them went south. Uh, and then in a final route of the Russians after the Bolshevik Revolution, a lot of Assyrians went sort of north again. Um, and some of, but some of them went towards British lines. The Assyrians were working against the Ottoman Empire. The, the sort of remnant of the Assyrian men were working with the, uh, with the British who were invading Mesopotamia and they, uh, some Assyrian civilians, some of whom came from this area, some of them came from this area, which is Lake Ermia Shores, um, came into Mesopotamia and were housed in, in various parts of Northern Mesopotamia, especially the Bakuba refugee camp, where a lot of people were basically dying of malaria and, and starvation and childhood mortality due to the bad conditions until things could improve under sort of British mandate of League of Nations. After the war, the uh, one of the Ottoman leaders, Jamal Pasha, um, imperial naval minister, uh, said that there had been crimes perpetrated by the Kurds and the Turks. So they kind of uniquely admitted it. Um, now, some Nazis admitted their crimes after the war, but some of them denied it. Uh, so this is kind of a, a, a unique admission that you don't often see. Uh, but they blamed the Muscovite policy, the Muscovite policy of, of stirring up Armenians uh, for to attack the rear of the Ottoman forces, which had been the, the interior minister's line during the war. Um, so, but they admitted there were crimes, or he admitted there were crimes. Also, there was a, 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 a military tribunal at Istanbul, uh, extraordinary military court martial that um, indicted or, or charged Ottoman officials and militia leaders with these massacres and thefts of civilian property and a and variety of other things. And um, in a book about this by Tanner Acham uh, of Clark University and Vahak and Dadri in the late Vahak and Dadri, um, th there was a Kurdish parliamentarian of the Ottoman Empire who's quoted with, with another admission, basically saying, facing the threat of an attempt upon his life, meaning the Ottoman like as a person was threatened um, personalized Ottoman Empire, and of aggression, meaning again the Russian aggression, he, the Ottoman Empire, delivered a powerful punch. As a result, our citizens were deported and destroyed, but 80% of them were innocent people. So there, there was a lumping in of the innocent with the guilty, uh, and therefore crimes were committed. Lyman von Sanders to be tried was an interesting uh, headline from 1919, The Independent. So a German general had actually taken joint command of the German Ottoman forces um, during the war, they had a, a, a unified staff, uh, and sort of the Germans were like the backbone of the Ottoman army. It was like their weapons and so forth. Although they had, they had also borrowed a lot of money from Britain and London to, to buy all this stuff. Um, so he was put on trial for ordering the massacres of Armenians and Syrians. And the theory was, um, the Germans had a, uh, had a policy or a scheme to deport the Armenians to Mesopotamia and build a railway from Istanbul to Mesopotamia and use the Armenians to sort of uh, farm this land in, in Mesopotamia to make like a new granary of the central powers uh, like Egypt had been a granary of you know the Roman Empire and Ukraine had been a granary of the Soviet Union. This Mesopotamia would be a great, because it has these two great rivers, Tigris and Euphrates, hence the name Mesopotamia. It would be a granary of the joint Ottoman-German uh, empire. Uh, so he was behind these deportations, the allies believed. But these trials were called off because the, the allied occupation of Istanbul sort of collapsed and uh, everything was put on sort of kibosh. Raphael Lemkin wrote about this period in 1946. He said, the massacre of the Armenians was an example of the destruction of entire nations. He also wrote of other examples. Um, 
And he wrote in, in, I think, 1951 or so about how the destruction of the Christians under the Ottoman Empire, not just the Armenians, all the Christians, along with the slaughter of the Assyrians in 1933 and the Hereros before that, and the pogroms that we heard about previously before that, um, were uh, known cases of genocide. Well, in recent times, you know, you, of course, we hear a lot of uh, de historical debate and um, contention about this time. There are a lot of books saying you can't really compare Ottoman policy in the First World War to German policy in the Second World War because the Germans were anti-Semites. The Ottomans were not anti-Armenian. The Ottomans had Armenians in, in sort of parliament and, and the civil service and the commerce and so forth. So you can't really compare the two. Uh, however, you know, other research has revealed that the Armenians actually suffered worse pogroms than the Jews suffered under the period of anti-Semitism prior to Nazism, the, the, um, the Rush, primarily Russian and Ukrainian pogroms. Uh, the Armenians had a larger death toll from them, it is thought, you know, two or three hundred thousand and three hundred thousand if you include like Assyrians and, and maybe other other people. Uh, and other than Armenians, the Assyrians suffered pogroms just as Christians, uh, killing about 10 to 20,000 people in the, in the mid 19th century. And the Greeks up to 50,000 in the early 19th century during their war of independence. So there were these anti-Christian, even if they weren't anti-Armenian, like racially, um, racial rape violence and pogroms, even prior to World War I and then the so-called revolution. Um, the Committee of Union and Progress, which took over the Ottoman Empire, wanted domination to be the, the, the regime and an end to the, the excessive toleration of prior sultans. Uh, the, there was a governor who referred to Armenians as microbes, like the Nazis would refer to Jews as microbes and germs. Um, the Turkish race was said to be the foundation stone of the empire by that, that author I, I referred to in 1922, the, the co-ruler. Uh, they had these journals and, and newspapers that talked about Turan, the, the eastern uh, part of the Turkic group, becoming more um, ethno-nationalist in the Ottoman Empire and, and less tolerant of other races uh, and so forth. It went in, even into the Kemalist period, which I don't have time to get into. Uh, R.J. Rummel wrote about all this in his, his seminal book in 1994. He said that, you know, not just a million or more Armenians, but 400,000 Greeks and 45,000 Assyrians were deported and massacred in, in a decade starting in 1914, the early stages of the First World War. And I noted in, in 2011 that the Turkish government has condemned far smaller and more limited massacres of Muslims as genocide in the 20th and 21st century, uh, including in Cyprus, they referred to a genocide against the Turks of Cyprus in 1974, uh, Bosnia in 1992, they were talking about 20,000 Bosnians being killed as a genocide in 1992. Uh, in Kosovo, they were talking about 10 to, to 100,000 Kosovar Albanians being killed by Yugoslavians in 1999 as a genocide. And, and they've referred to uh, China and, and, and uh, Palestine experiencing genocides in the, in the 21st century uh, when, you know, much smaller proportions of the population were killed than in the First World War. Uh, I am going to skip all this in the interest of time. I'm going to talk, talk about Iraq, uh, just to, to close. Iraq is, of course, a, a part of the former Ottoman Empire, was the Arabian sort of uh, eastern side of the Ottoman Empire, along with some other parts. Um, it was a claimed homeland of the Assyro Chaldeans. You know, like the Ukrainians and others claimed a homeland after the First World War, the, the Assyrians were seeking a homeland. It was denied at Versailles and, and Lausanne. Um, the Semela massacre in Iraq is when the Iraqi Arab nationalist uh, government believed that the Assyrians were putting on a uh, sort of secession or revolution to have a, an Assyrian pocket in northern Iraq, close to Nineveh. Uh, so between, you know, 1,000 and, and 6,000 Assyrians were killed by the army and, and allied tribes to sort of uh, suppress the Assyrian movement in 1933. As I said, Lumpkin referred to this as a genocide. 
Um, since then, there's been a lot of destruction of Assyrian villages and churches on both sides of the Iraqi-Turkish border um, in the context of Kurdish nationalist movements, um, sort of denying a sea for the Kurdish rebels to swim in by destroying villages in, in the thousands on both sides. Uh, this reached a peak in, in the late 80s and early 90s when Iraq declared prohibited zones inside of Iraq uh, under the Interior Ministry and parts of the Army and Intelligence, uh, where no living thing was allowed to remain if it was not part of the Army. Um, there's something similar in Turkey where there are these mined areas where they tell you if, if, if you try to drive there, the Turkish Army will tell you, don't go there. It's prohibited. There's mines. Um, there's an analogy between these areas, I would argue, and you know what Turkey would refer to as genocide in, in Western Myanmar or Eastern Ukraine or other places where there's like you know heavy fighting and mines and people being deported and having to flee with just their shirt on their back uh, as a genocide. Um, then we have the rise of ISIS, of course, uh, the United States, Britain. Um, Spain, some other countries invade Iraq in 2003 under spurious allegations of, of possession of weapons of mass destruction and support for Al Qaeda, uh, covering up the, the, the real support for Al Qaeda in, in federal court. Um, and then there's an insurgency, you know, led by Al Qaeda, but joined by parts of the Iraqi army and Iraqi nationalists that sort of date back in their education to the Semela massacre period through. There was a continuity between Ottoman military education, Iraqi Arab nationalist military uh, military education, Baathist military education, and then people joining ISIS as former uh, Iraqi officers um, to persecute, especially the Shia, but you know also Kurds, Assyrians, and Yazidis and Mandaeans. Um, and these these insurgent groups went through the stages of genocide, according to Lemkin and and you know Greg Stanton and others identification of the of the enemy group, dehumanization of the group, saying we should get rid of them. Uh, there was a good article by two of the, uh, the co-prosecutors of the, uh, the Cambodian tribunal um, and another uh, an, an American scholar talking about all the uh, genocidal rhetoric of Al Qaeda in 2006, 7, 8, 9. Um, this was like five years before the, the real discussion of genocide in, in northern Iraq. But there was this dehumanizing rhetoric against infidels, Christians, crusaders, uh, polytheists, Shia. Um, the, the word takfiri is, is some, a Muslim who calls another Muslim an infidel. This is the takfiri ideology of, of Al Qaeda, according to the Shia and Iranian view of it. Um, and then targeting of these groups, terrorist attacks. Um, you've probably seen a lot of these pictures, but you know, in a in a Chaldean church in Baghdad in 2010, 58 people were killed by by bombings and shootings in, in one day. Uh, in 2007, 500 Yazidis were killed with by truck bombs in northern Iraq. Um, large groups of Kurds and Shia just bombed in in, in marketplaces, political party offices and other places. Um, and then finally, we have the, the recognition or denial of genocide phase where people, the Iraqi government, then parts of the UN, like the rapporteurs, then like parts of Europe and the United States and Australia and other places started to say there's a genocide in Iraq against minorities. And then also partial denial where the UN says, no, it only affected Yazidis because other people could pay a tax or convert to Islam and survive. So therefore they are not victims of genocide, even though there was this massacre in a church or they had to flee with just their shirt on their back. Or, uh, but because it was only partial, it's not a genocide, but the Yazidis were total, that was a genocide. So you have this dynamic of, of partial recognition and denial of the Iraqi genocide post 2006. Just to show you a brief map of this area, Sinjar, you probably heard about the, the attacks on Sinjar where the Yazidis living in Sinjar city and, and Kocho village and other villages were attacked by ISIS and, and the men were massacred and the women were enslaved and, and bought and sold and, and abused. And the population had to flee this mountainous area, Mount Sinjar, and they were like dying of thirst and hunger in the dozens until there was sort of uh, 
President Obama announced an intervention, and then the um, some Yazidi and 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 Kurdish and uh, uh, Turkish Kurd and Syrian Kurd forces started to uh, evacuate or open up a, a corridor for these people to get off the mountain and and get to Kurdish controlled or Syrian Kurdish controlled areas um, because ISIS had taken Mosul in June of 2014 and then they attacked Sinjar in August 2014 and then they attacked the Nineveh Plains over here in mid-August 2014 and basically emptied a lot of these Christian areas of Karakosh, uh, Bartela, Bashika, and Tel Kaif um, in mid-August 2014. Uh, and many places have never been repopulated by Christians. So it's sort of the last stage of the, of the cleansing of the Christian areas. First, you have the Ottoman genocide. Then you have the clearance of the Turkish-Iraqi border areas. Uh, and finally, you have this. Um, sort of the the death knell or extinction of the Christians of uh, of Iraq for the most part, leaving you know only like one in ten or or two in ten of of the numbers that used to be there. Um, I feel like I'm running out of time, so I should probably just close by noting that the the United States recognized this genocide uh, as affecting not only Yazidis but also Christians and Shia um, in 2018. Um, this is a map of what happened, uh, how basically Christians and Yazidis had to flee most of these areas that were occupied by ISIS, and they also included much of Syria. Almost all of Syria used to be ISIS infiltrated until 2015. Uh, the Russian intervention starts, and they start losing these yellow areas, and then finally they lose these orange areas, and finally the red areas. Um, will there be any remedy for all this? Of course, there could be reconstruction like people talk about for Ukraine, but it's very slow in Iraq. And there has been some church and, and Yazidi temple reconstruction and, and Shia shrine reconstruction uh, and Kurdish village reconstruction, but it's, it's very, it's, it's like one in 10 things has been rebuilt basically. And in Turkey, things are, are, are proceeding even more slowly than that. The EU has a resolution saying that confiscated property from the first world war must be returned to their relevant churches. And the U.S. Congress had a, a non-binding declaration saying this should happen too, but it's probably not going to happen. Uh, it's proceeding very slowly, and things are actually going the opposite way in some respects due to the, the HDP uh, parliamentarians being arrested and, and there being an upswing in, in Kurdish-Turkish conflict in that area, but which we could talk about in the Q&A if you're interested. Thank you very much for hosting me, and I look forward to our Q&A. Uh, thank you so much, Professor Travis. Uh, uh, it was a really nice lecture. Uh, as I had mentioned you earlier, uh, it was it was your book, The Genocide in Middle East, that uh, gained my uh, interest towards uh, genocides uh, that happening in Middle East. And I'm really glad that you kept my request and took up the took up the topic of Middle East in in your lecture. Your lecture was really impressive, and and we really look forward to uh, reading the publication of yours yeah and so we would uh, thanks very much thank you thank you so much professor and we we i would like to thank uh, all our speakers for a wonderful uh, 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 conversation and for a wonderful uh, uh, lecture today they had provided and it was a really insightful insightful session so we would like to go ahead with the uh, with the question is, and we have uh, we have a question uh, which is for Professor Kernan, like uh, as 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 Professor Kernan, you mentioned that uh, the the Khmer Rouge at a time uh, denou denounced their uh, Marxist characteristics, uh, Marxist Leninist char characteristics, and considered the themselves as revolutionaries, revolution, uh, be believers of revolution, revolutionism. So can we somehow, you, you know, like draw a parallel with the, with the, uh, the Juche, state, Juche state of North Korea and the Khmer Rouge? Well, I'd like to specify that the Khmer Rouge didn't specifically 
uh, denounce Marxism, I, I think we could draw the conclusion that they implicitly did so in the, in the ways that I drew attention to from their documents and statements. Uh, but uh, they did claim to be Marxist-Leninist. Uh, and uh, I think that's important, although they also claimed not to be copying anybody. Uh, and they also departed from, uh, I think, both Stalinism and Maoism, while also taking up elements of those two ideologies. Um, but I think it's also important that they had shared characteristics with Nazism as well as with those two uh, communist regimes of Stalin and Mao. Uh, but I think uh, what is important is the homegrown racism as well as those other influences and shared characteristics. I, I think that uh, accounts for the uh, explicit uh, genocidal characteristics of the Khmer Rouge regime. I, does, does that answer the question? Yes, Professor. Uh, thank you so much. And uh, there is uh, one question uh, from uh, one of our, from the research team of CGC. Uh, one of our researcher, uh, uh, Federico uh, Alistair D'Alessio, wanted to ask this to uh, uh, all the speakers, like, uh, that the question is bearing in mind that the three main superpowers, China, Russia, and US, do not recognize the International Criminal Court. To what extent can this institution serve as a bulwark against uh, bulwark bulwark against genocide and other crimes against humanity? Uh, but Professor Kanan, would you like to go ahead and then the other speakers? Well, I think it's important that the United States um, did, after a long delay, uh, sign the uh, UN Genocide Convention. I think it was in 1988, I think 40 years after other uh, United Nations uh, countries signed the Genocide Convention. Uh, so I think it's, it, it's important that uh, in the case of Rwanda, while the genocide was going on in Rwanda in uh, 1990s, uh, the United States was very careful not to recognize that it was a genocide because that would have committed the, US, the United States to take action. So the uh, Clinton uh, administration at that time uh, said that this, what was happening in Rwanda was acts of genocide rather than specifically a genocide. Uh, because to recognize it as a genocide while it was ongoing would have uh, committed the U.S. to take action under the Genocide Convention because uh, six years earlier, the U.S. had signed the Genocide Convention. So I think the U.S. is uh, uh, obliged to take action to prevent genocide and to, t to uh, interrupt or take, take other actions to... Uh, counteract genocide under the, it's the, as, as a signatory to the UN Genocide Convention and, uh, and other signatories are obliged to do that uh, as well. Uh, so I think that's an important factor. Maybe uh, Omer and Hannibal have uh, things to add to that. Indeed. Uh, thank you so much. And uh, Professor Bertok, would you like to comment on this? Well, I, I think the, the question was about the International Criminal Court, right? <clears throat> yes. Um, and the US has not joined it. And, and obviously, without the US, China, and Russia being part of it, uh, it's, it's greatly handicapped. Um, because like any court, uh, a court needs also a police force to enforce anything that it uh, uh, decides and um, that part of it is lacking. Um, I, I don't think that means that the ICC is unimportant. I, I, I think it was an important addition to the international order, uh, but I, I'm, I'm hoping, I think, like Ben Kiernan, that in the long run, uh, 
the US will join the ICC, but uh, we may have to wait a few more decades uh, before that happens. <laughs> yeah, sure. Uh, that's that's might be a thing. Uh, and yeah, and uh, Professor uh, uh, Professor uh, Travis, would you like to uh, would you like to point some highlights? Yeah, I mean, of course, the the International Criminal Court was Raphael Lemkin's dream for early uh, deterrence and declaration of a genocide, which has not come to pass. Um, because most of the countries of the world have an alliance of some kind with either the US, Russia, or China, or both. So um, while the Security Council is there, and, and most of the world's armed forces are not part of the ICC, you're not going to have an effective deterrent. Even as to the countries that are supposedly not under the protection of, of the, the big three or the big five, um, like Sudan, you know, they didn't they didn't turn over their president even after a couple of revolutions and the ICC won't try him in absentia. So here we are at almost 20 years after the genocide began in Darfur and there's been uh, no proceeding against the, the sort of top level people. There's like a there's like a Janjaweed commander who's just beginning his proceedings. But that is not, you know, in terms of deterrence theory to punish somebody 20 years later and you know, there's a 90% chance you are not punished is a very weak deterrent. Absolutely. Yes. Uh, and uh, so I think we should uh, wrap up our session. Uh, uh, thank you so much uh, to the speakers for joining, uh, uh, for accepting our invitation and joining us for a wonderful, uh, insightful uh, event. And this means a lot for CGC and our CGC would like to continue uh, working on genocide, Holocaust studies and would like to pursue research on this. And today's session would be really an asset for our, our, our research. And we really look forward for future collaborations with, other spe with the speakers, Professor Kernan, Professor Bertov and Professor Travis. And uh, to all the viewers, uh, we would like to mention that uh, CGC would be uh, very soon uh, uh, coming with new contents. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.